Hello, I'm Luca Torix, and welcome to my Byzantine Faction Guide for Medieval 2 Total War. Today I'm going to be discussing the units, the campaign strategy, basically everything to do with the grand campaign of the Byzantine Empire. Now before I get started properly, there is something I want to say very, very quickly, which is I'm going to be pronouncing them the Byzantines. Now I know a lot of people pronounce them the Byzantines, there's variable interpretations on how to pronounce them. In my opinion, that doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, with a lot of the city names and the faction names, they're based off of either Latin or Hebrew or Arabic names, and what we're saying is anglicised versions of them anyway. So, for example, it probably wasn't even pronounced Byzantine in those days, that's an anglicised version of whatever they called it, as an example. So, yeah, just thought I'd get that out of the way, that I am going to be pronouncing it Byzantine because, I don't know, I feel like it's a little bit of an issue, uh, sort of a controversial issue, but anyway, it shouldn't be affecting the video too much. So. The Byzantine Empire, they are situated in the purple region, quite a few settlements they own, it's a very interesting faction. They're orthodox, which is important, it's, you know, this game is very important to recognise what religion you are and what religion the factions around you are. So, the Byzantines in this region over here, as I said, the remnants of Rome, you could argue. Um, the long campaign rules to hold 45 regions, including the Rome region and the Jerusalem region, I think that's harder than a lot of factions, I think... Most factions, it's 45 plus just Jerusalem. Let's have a look. Yeah, so for example, England, it's a lot easier. Because it's 45 regions and Jerusalem. So you don't have to go for Rome. But Byzantines, it's more difficult because you have to get Rome as well. So that's kind of interesting to sort of think about. Their strengths, good heavy cavalry and missile cavalry, capable archers. Weaknesses, lacks late period gunpowder. And... This is the thing with the Byzantines, they become significantly weaker than other factions in the late game because they don't have the technology to keep up with anyone, basically. It's a problem, it's a challenge, but it is certainly a problem if you are playing in the late period, uh, for sure. That's why you need to establish yourself early, it's quite important with the Byzantine Empire in particular. So, first of all we're going to be having a look at the units, and then we'll be discussing some campaign strategy. So, what you'll notice straight away is that the Byzantine roster is extremely small. There is very little variation in units, and you can see there is basically no gunpowder units. There's no firearms. It's crazy, really. It really is. But it does make for a very fascinating faction, I will say that. So, we'll start off with peasants, as usual. And, as I say as usual, they are cannon fodder. They're useless, other than to be cannon fodder, uh, for attack, three defense with a one charge, poor morale, vulnerable to missiles. So really, I can't see many excuses to be using peasants. There will be a few odd occasions, but certainly never rely on them in battle. Next up, town militia. And these are, of course, a common unit as well. They are commoners and peasants levied into local militias to defend settlements and bolster armies. They're not a huge step up from peasants. They haven't got the poor morale, which is good. Their attack is 5, defense of 7, which is better than the peasants. You can see that it's 4 and 3, 5 and 7, so it is a step up. Combat bonus in woods, which isn't really that useful in my opinion. They're an alright defensive unit if you want to just defend your town. Leave a small garrison in, then yeah, town militia can do that job, which is good. Byzantine spearmen. A step up from spearmen militia. These troops are equipped with a spear and shield capable of deforming deforming forming a defensive ring that would be bad if they could deform a defensive ring well i mean they'd be quite offensive i suppose but anyway um attack of five defense of seven so relatively similar stats but the fact that they can form a skiltrum and i say this every time the defensive formation of a skiltrum kind of similar to a phalanx is it sort of bolsters their defense and makes them more compact it means it's more difficult to reach them so in fact although it's a defense of seven I would say definitely they are better at defending than town militia because these guys cannot form the defensive skill trim position. And the fact that they can form a sort of spear wall or a spear ring, as it describes it, is means they can have a bonus fighting cavalry, which is again good, uh, particularly for defending settlements and tight streets. Spear militia. So very, very similar again. Five attack, seven defense, combat bonus in woods, bonus fighting cavalry, but notice they cannot form a skill trim. They do have long spears. Now, this is quite important. The longer the spear, the harder it is to get to them, which is quite cool. So, long spears is good, but the fact they can't form a skill tree means they are more vulnerable uh, than the Byzantine spearmen. Okay, Byzantine infantry. Now, this is quite a bit later on, sort of more technologically advanced for Byzantine. Still, 
really isn't in the grand scheme of things, but whatever. Byzantine infantry unit equipped with a sword, shield, and mail armor. The armor is very, very important because it bolsters their defense. You can see their defense is 18, which is a lot better. It's 11 better than these spearmen, which is cool. Their attack is better because they're not using a sort of defensive spear. They're using a sword and shield, as it said. Um, so 11 attack is pretty good. Charge bonus of two is okay. So these guys, less defensive minded, even though the defense stand is better, but they're more of an offensive unit. They're not really used for holding tight streets. You want to use them, get involved in the fighting on the front line. Dismounted Byzantine Lancers. Early period, very similar stats. 11 attack, 18 defense, 2 charge. In fact, exactly the same. Good stamina is good because, you know, good. Um, because it means they can fight for longer. They're less likely to break. If a unit gets tired, then their morale starts to get lower. They're going to be much more likely to break. So they're equipped with... Um, armor which is cool as well it's why they've got 18 defense and and they are well trained and disciplined troops which is good next up this is where the pronunciation time comes in i'm sorry this is i don't know how to pronounce this varangian guard that's what i'm gonna guess varangian guard i don't know anyway they are superb two-handed axemen protected by heavy armor these guys are pretty badass i like these guys um early period it says here attack of 20 well, that is good that is very good for you know, I mean, they're holding heavy axes, you'd expect that. But still, really, really awesome stat. 15 defense still, and that's because they have uh, the armor and all that. They are well armored, as it says there. Effective against armor. Charge bonus of 6, which is pretty cool, Ken. Because they're axemen. They'll just charge in, chop people's heads off. It's beautiful stuff. Combat bonus in woods or snow. Good morale, which is very important. That means they're less likely to break. And good stamina. Same thing, really. So pretty solid unit i would say again this is a much more offensive unit than the spearmen but they're two-handed axemen you're not going to expect them to stand there in formation you want them to charge forward and take advantage of that six charge bonus next up more pronunciation dismounted latin con i'm sorry for this if i said that wrong anyway western european troops fighting for the byzantine empire these experienced fighters are effective even on foot Attack of 13, which is slightly less than what we've just seen, but defense of 21 is very, very solid. And you know why they've got a defense of 21. You can see their badass armor. They've got the helmets and all that. As it says there, well armored, good morale, good stamina. These guys are hard to break down, and they will pack a punch as well, which is really cool. But that's basically all the infantry. That is it. Like, there isn't anything else. I say that, I mean, these guys are melee infantry, but I'm talking about, sorry, missile infantry for melee infantry that is it not a lot like other factions have like double the amount so yeah there we go okay now the missile lads peasant archers i mention these guys every time they will do all right if you put them on top of a wall or a high position you know their, their missile attack is a bit underwhelming they're completely useless in the melee but they got the flaming missiles they can do a bit of a job because well they can reach you but you can't reach them if you haven't got archers. So it's always useful to have a couple of archers. And these guys are cheap. They can do a little bit of a job in the early game. They can't do anything later game because everyone will have armor. And these guys are not armor piercing in any way. Next, archer militia. A type of trained civilian guard called... It says... Yeah, you can see it. <laughs> I'm sorry. This series is very, very difficult for me to pronounce. I'm much better with the pronunciations on Rome Total War. I'm more familiar. Responsible for protecting settlements, roads, and forts. Attack of six, defense of three. So they're slightly more competent in the melee, which is cool. Uh, their missile attack is exactly the same, though. So again, a bit underwhelming on the missile attack side, but at least they are more competent if they do get, you know, sort of reached by the um, melee infantry that's attacking them. They can kind of hold their own, but still, not really. These guys are all much, much stronger in the melee, of course, because that's their specialty. Next up, Trebizond Archers. Now, this is an improvement. Hailing from the edge of the Black Sea, these well-trained archers wear padded armor and use a composite bow. So the armor means they have a much better defense of seven. So that means they're less vulnerable to missiles themselves. And also, they can hold their own a little bit more, which is cool. Don't know how useful that really is for an archer. You could argue it's not useful. You could argue, as a last resort, it is useful. It's a nice touch to have, I suppose. And they're early period as well, so that's cool. An attack of set, uh, 8 means they, they can pack a punch. But what's better about them is their missile attack is nearly doubled. It's 9. 9 missile attack, which is pretty solid for an early game archer. That's pretty good indeed. 
Long range missiles is what I like about these guys more. So it means they can hit you from further. You can start getting damage on your opponent long, long before they reach you, meaning you've already got kills without being killed yourself, which is cool. And the flaming missiles lower the morale, etc., etc. So that's pretty good. Then we have Byzantine Guide Guide? Byzantine Guard Archers. High period. Now you might think these guys look a lot more impressive compared to these guys, and you're right, they are impressive compared to the rest. But still, considering in the high period, as it calls it, the late, late period, other factions have got guns, and they have gunpowder, and these guys are still using a bow and arrow. These guys are really inferior to what you'll be facing from other factions if they are technologically advanced. Attack of 11, defense of 16 is very, very good. I will say that for a missile troop. Uh, you know, you compare them to these guys and they are comparable to some of the higher level um, melee infantry specialists. But the missile attack is only 9, which is very low for late game. They're not armor piercing. Now, a lot of the troops, like these guys, are going to have good armor. In fact, this, this isn't even amazing armor. You will see better armor on cavalry and infantry from other factions because, again, they're more technologically advanced. So... If you come against knights or something with good armor, these guys aren't going to do a lot. And their missile attack is only 9, so they're not going to hit a lot of damage either. They're just they're not hugely useful in the late game. It's a bit annoying. But there you go. That's the sort of downside of playing uh, as this faction. Long range missiles is good though. Good morale and good stamina. They can hold their own in the melee. But again, if, if you've got to the point where miss, melee troops are hitting your archers, you've probably lost the battle anyway. So it's not really that useful. And again, although they can hold their own, if you're using these guys in the late game, anyone that reaches you in the melee late game is going to have stats better than 11 and 16. So really, they can't hold their own, meaning these guys aren't really that useful at all. They have a little bit of use if you put them on top of a wall, maybe. Defending a city, they can do a little bit against unarmored troops. But in the main, they're not really that good. It's kind of a shame, but there you go. So let's get on to the cavalry now, and we have militia cavalry to start off with. Poorly trained, these units fight with a spear and a sword. That's all the game says about them, and that's all that really can be said about them. Very, very underwhelming. Attack of 7, defense of 10. Defense of 10 is okay for cavalry, not really that great though. No armor at all, no morale bonus. Very boring troop to be honest, not a lot to say. Next, Byzantine lancers. A bit more interesting. They're well trained, which is you know, good I suppose, disciplined troops used throughout the Byzantine Empire, these lances are well armoured and equipped, yeah, so attack of 8, defence of 13, defence of 13 for cavalry is pretty solid, but again, no armour on them, so they're going to be inferior to late, late game cavalry, but this is early cavalry, so what can you expect, good stamina is important, it's more important for cavalry to have good stamina than infantry I find, because cavalry are more likely to be moving long, long distances, so the good stamina is pretty cool, it means they're less likely to um, have morale debuffs, and also they can keep running at a fast pace, catching rousing troops until late on in the fight, so that's quite cool, but again, these guys aren't amazing. Then, Latin come. If I've said that right, I'm sorry. Uh, Western European troops fighting for the Byzantine Empire. Very similar to the dismounted versions of these. You can see them here. Um, these experienced and well-trained fighters are armed with lances and swords. 10 attack, 15 defense. Again, 15 defense is pretty good. They can form a wedge. May charge without orders. Now, this is something which is slightly ambiguous because I don't like the fact that some troops charge without orders. I like having organized armies. I find if my troops start charging, I lose track of them, or they just... And they, the thing is, this is just typical. They they won't charge into a weak unit and win the battle for you. They'll charge face first into a skiltrum of spears, that which have a bonus against cavalry, and they'll just die. That's the kind of stupid thing that they'll do. So, you know, I'm not a big fan of the charging without orders. Good morale, though, is good, and that for cavalry is rare and... A pretty, you know, it's pretty important. I, I like to have cavalry that has good morale. Powerful charge is important as well. Well armoured and good stamina. So, pretty solid troop. I just don't like the fact that they're disorganised is what I would say. Particularly for late game cavalry, that's not very good at all. Now, okay, early period. I'm just going to call them cataphract because that's basically what they are. Cataphractoi. I think it's, they're basically cataphracts. Cataphracts in Rome Total War are heavy heavily armoured cavalry, um, which is basically what these guys are. Very heavily armoured, there you go, and equipped with a lance and mace. 
although somewhat outdated, they are still formidable troops. And saying somewhat outdated, as I just referenced, Rome Total War, which is from a long period before that, you know, factions like Parthia were using cataphracts, um, and they're long gone at this point. So they are outdated, but still pretty solid. If you can get them in the early game, I do quite like them. A defense of 16 is very, very good for cavalry, particularly in the early game. Good morale. The fact they're well armored means they are going to be hard to break down. So basically, they're very, very good in the early game, but in the late game, they're just going to be outdated, like the game says. Next up, General's Bodyguard. This is the early period uh, General's Bodyguard. Well armed and equipped, these elite troops have the task of guarding and fighting alongside the army's general. That means they have an attack of 13, defense of 17, which is solid. Not the best bodyguard in the game by a long stretch though. Hit points of 2, charge bones of 6. Good morale, well armoured, very good stamina. So a solid troop, but you'd expect that because they're defending a general. Finally, we have three more units of cavalry. These are the missile cavalry units. So, hmm, Skith, Skithicon. I think I said that. Now, these basically are Scythians, which you, you know, probably gathered. It's just they pronounce sort of a more Latin version, I think. Um... Yeah, you know I'm a big fan of Scythians from Rome Total War. If you've watched any of my Rome Total War videos, you know I'm a big fan of Scythian horse archers and just Scythia in general. So these are Asiatic nomads who served the Byzantine Empire as horse archers, wearing little armour and armed with a composite bow. So these guys are basically the same as Scythian horse archers. And the good thing about Scythian horse archers are they're kind of OP in Rome Total War, but that's a long period before this. So these guys are going to become outdated very, very quickly. It's good the fact that you can have basically archers who can hit you but it's impossible to hit back because they're so fast. But if they get cornered into fighting in the melee, they're screwed. They are screwed. Defensive 3 is just not good enough to hold against any cavalry or any infantry pretty much. I mean, these guys will struggle in the melee. But as long as you make sure they keep skirmishing, they keep back and they just keep firing, they'll do a solid job in the early game. They have better missile attack than these guys and they're faster because they're horses obviously. Next up Byzantine Cavalry also early game same missile attack but the good thing about these guys comparatively to the Scythian version the Asiatic version uh, is that they have a defense of 12 and attack of 7 so they are slightly more competent in the melee they are versatile lightly armored medium cavalry equally able shooting their bows or fighting with their swords as I kind of alluded to so they are less vulnerable than these guys and they are more diverse these guys once they run out of missiles they're useless these guys not Quite so much, I would say. Last one are Varda. Yeah, so Varda, we'll just call them. But Varda. Vardaria Tote, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, what can I say? I haven't studied this <laughs> at, um, you know, university or whatever. I, I just don't know how to pronounce it. But it doesn't matter because, you know, it's a game, whatever. Disciplined and highly trained. These guys wear uh, light armor and fight a composite bow from horseback. Better missile attack. Now, 9 missile attack on Archer Cavalry is pretty decent, but again, they, these are late period lads, so it's kind of what you'd expect. They're fast moving. Defense of 17 is good. The thing is, again, they're not armor piercing. So if they're fighting troops with good armor, you're kind of screwed. None of the missile troops have armor piercing at all. Whereas the gunpowder troops, for example, and other factions do have armor piercing. So if knights charge against them, at least they're still a little bit useful. These guys are pretty much useless against late game infantry and cavalry, which are really highly defended. And that is where the Byzantines really struggle is in the late game, which you're kind of seeing the evidence of now. So next up are the siege equipment and all of this. Now, my first video, which I believe was the England faction guide, I went through these guys so i'm not going to go through it again because it'd be the same every episode but if you want to learn about the blister catapults trebuchets all that go and watch my england faction faction guide i explain it it's the same for all factions basically so there you go and then finally two sort of mercenary units allen like cavalry hardy horsemen accustomed to the plains and steppes of eastern europe and the black sea region excellent light cavalry and light cavalry to have an attack of 11 and defense of 13 is pretty good because, of course, the, the, the good thing with light cavalry is they're fast moving, as opposed to heavy cavalry. These guys, for example, will be really slow because they're cataphracts, basically. But these guys are fast, and the fact they have solid melee stats is pr 
pretty solid as well, to be honest, yeah. And then we have some horse archers, human horse archers, Asiatic nomads who fight as mercenary horse archers wearing little armor and armed with a composite bow. Sounds similar to these guys? Yeah, that's because they are similar to those guys, basically. Pretty much exactly the same stats. So I'm not really going to say much more about them. That's all that really needs to be said. So what we're going to do now, we're going to have a look at some campaign strategy and we'll watch the video introducing Byzantines first though. Byzantium stands on the crossroads of Europe, Asia and Africa. A prophetic dream led the Emperor Constantine to found the city, which is a center of culture, commerce and diplomacy. Right, so here is the Byzantine Empire. You start off with a few settlements. Um, actually, one of the most in the game. Not quite. France, I believe, has more. And I think the Seljuks might have more, but definitely France does. And actually, saying that, I think it's, it's five settlements. It might be the same. Oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so you start off with a relatively spread out empire over several different, what is now different nations. It's a very interesting faction with a lot of factions around it. Very interesting start position. So you start off with Corinth, Thessalonica, Constantinople, which is very important. Nicaea, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm pretty sure. Nicaea and Nicosia. Very important to differentiate between the two. But you can see the empire spreads from Nicosia all the way up to Thessalonica. It's quite a distance. You know, if you compare it to other factions like, I don't know, Sicily or um, Milan or something or Denmark even, you know, very, very spread out. So, interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the Fog of War. As I say every time, I don't play with the Fog of War on, uh, off, rather. I always play with the Fog of War on. I consider it cheating, you know, turning it off. It's not meant to be off. It's the whole point of the game. But just so I can show you who's around exactly and what's going on around, I am going to toggle the Fog of War off. Beautiful. Okay, so... This is the situation. You have the Venetians over here and a couple of rebel settlements, but you have the Venetians over here. You have the Hungarians to the north with a slight buffer zone of a few rebel settlements. You have the Seljuk Turks over here. And then, I mean, technically, you know, there is the Venetians down here as well. Um, there's a few rebel settlements around this region. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically the situation. The Egyptians are over here, but they probably won't be too much of a threat to you. They're quite far away. So, here is the situation. Now, there's a lot of different ways you could face it, because the thing is, with the Byzantines, you have lots of competing factions. The Seljuks are going to probably want to move this way. The Hungarians might want to move north against the Poles, but they, all, they also might want to move south against the Venetians and you. The Venetians are almost certainly going to move in this direction. Pretty much always, I've found, they always try and take Zagreb, try, try and take Durazzo, which I believe is like modern-day Croatia. And they try and move in this region. And once they're at Durazzo, all oh, they're right on your doorstep. So, a little bit concerning. So, it, the strategy very much depends on what Hungary does and what the Seljuks do. But likely that at least one of those two will attack you. Probably more likely the Seljuks, I would imagine. So, here's what I do. Let's start off with the Seljuks and how I would deal with them. I personally never bother to deal with the Seljuks in the early game. The, re the reason is, is because, well... They kind of have a problem, which is they have two problems. They have the Mongols and they have the Timurids. Now, depending on how quick you are, you might never see the Timurids. The, Mon the Mongols, you might see. So, when the Mongols come in, they'll probably come over from over here. They could come from down there, whatever. But they're likely to come into Seljuk territory, take settlements like Yerevan, Mosul, and then probably they'll have Edessa and Tbilisi or anything like that. So, at which point, 
the Seljuks will become severely weakened. Their com economy will be crippled because they probably will lose like two or three settlements at least. So they'll have trouble basically. They will have problems um, in the Middle East and that will be the time to strike, not in the early, early games. You can kind of wait and the thing is you can wait and maybe have an alliance with the Seljuks if you want, that's up to you. I quite like having alliances, it means they're less likely to attack you and then you can break the alliance once the Mongols start strike and take settlements like Iconium and Kaisaria. You can take Smyrna though, I think that's how you say it, Smyrna, Smyrna, yeah, I don't know. Um, nice rebel settlement and it won't involve you going to war with the Seljuks. And it means you have a nice slice over here. So I would go for Smyrna. I'm probably saying that wrong. I know I am. That's the thing. Anyway, but yeah, I would bother striking the Turks later on, basically, when they are a bit weaker. As for the Venetians, now, I would go for the Venetians first. That is what I do. I would blitz the Venetians. I would probably try and get an alliance with the Hungarians. Here's the thing. Here's the reason why. First of all, you want them really going to war with the Holy Roman Empire or the Poles. You don't want them fighting you because you don't want to fight too many factions early on. And I personally don't like expanding north into Bran, Budapest, Vienna, Krakow, Halic. I find these settlements not as useful. They're not on the Mediterranean Sea, so there's less trade going on and all that. You don't want to risk losing Constantinople. It is a big, big city to start off with. It's a large city. I think it's the only large city in the whole game. So very very profitable you don't want to lose that because the hungarians are annoyed with you i would probably form an alliance with these guys you're unlikely to ever move north for a long long time anyway bear in mind your campaign goals are to take rome which is here and jerusalem which is here so you're unlikely to be moving north particularly because you're going to try really the beautiful thing about this campaign is you're trying to reform the the roman empire which is just brilliant. Of course, of course, the Byzantines will be doing that. So really, you're going to be focusing on the Mediterranean regions rather than the Hungarians. So I wouldn't bother going for them. Instead, strike against the Venetians. They're strong, and they will get stronger and stronger and stronger comparatively to you because they will have gunpowder in the late game, and you won't, as we've discussed already. So go for Durazzo. Take it before the lads at Ragusa take it. Go for Zagreb, Ragusa. I would strike against the Venetians. They don't own a huge amount of settlements. They own... Iraklion, but they're relatively isolated there. They can't get troops from Ragusa to Iraklion easily, meaning that you can strike against them, but they can't really get reinforcements, which is good. It's to your advantage. Instead, then, I would focus on getting these two settlements down. Once you get Ragusa and Venice down, then you can strike against Iraklion. Venice are done for once you've taken those first two settlements, in my opinion. So I would go for Venice first. What it does leave you with is an unfortunate situation where it is your empire is even more spread out. You have all of this, all of this, and then all of this coastline as well, which is slightly annoying, but it's just something you're going to have to deal with. Deal with. And then for, you know, after that, it's up to you. You can strike against Milan, maybe. Similar sort of situation. They don't have many settlements, but they're good settlements on the Mediterranean Sea. But the thing is, you don't get the Pope too annoyed. It's a tough situation. It depends. Really, it depends how good you are at the game. If you want to blitz quickly and try and go through Italy, it's good because you can get a huge amount of money, you can get rid of the Pope or, you know, get rid of a lot of the Catholic factions which are a threat to you once you declare war on a Catholic faction, which is Venice. So it's up to you. But my general advice is don't strike against the Turks early on because they'll be weakened by the Mongols. Don't bother going up north because the Hungarians are tough to fight and there's just a lot of spread out settlements that aren't that valuable in my opinion. Instead, I'd be focusing on the Venetians and Italy first of all. If you can get Italy and Sicily region and have what is now modern day Greece, you're set. In my opinion, you're set. And even then, even in the late game when you don't have a lot of gunpowder, or you have no gunpowder basically, it doesn't matter a huge amount because you have such a big empire, you'll have so many troops, you can kind of deal with it more sufficiently. That is my general advice, but as I say, many variable interpretations. You could you could strike against the Hungarians, you could strike against the Seljuks. You ask different people, they're going to say different things. But for me, I would strike against the Venetians and the Italian factions first, um, with also taking rebel settlements like Smyrna as well. You could try and take Sofia, because the Hungarians might not move that far south. That's sort of up to your discretion, I would say. And it's a good buffer zone between uh, the Hungarians and Constantinople, which is cool as well. So that's pretty much all I've got to say for the Byzantines. Um, yep, yeah, this has been my faction guide. I will be doing more faction guides for all of the Medieval 2 Total War factions. So my next one I'll probably do is the Holy Roman Empire. 
but if you want me to do another one beforehand then just comment below and I might prioritize your one before the Holy Roman Empire. I haven't got a specific order, uh, but the default one, if nobody comments, will be the Holy Roman Empire, which will be out in about a week or so. So, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you around.